everybody for coming uh, and thank you to our audience on Zoom. And we're going to get started. We are very pleased uh, to have uh, Quentin as our guest speaker. Uh, this program was organized by Anti-Racism uh, Committee at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and we would like to uh, welcome you here. Uh, so we acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, the Napawek, and uh, Chanarkenton nations on lands connected with the London Township and Sambra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Bomb Palm. With this, uh, we respect the long-standing relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that indigenous peoples endure in Canada and we as accept responsibilities as a public institution to contribute toward revealing and correcting miseducation as well as renewing res respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. Uh, I'd like to introduce Quentin Versetti, uh, who has uh, graciously agreed to come and do this talk for us tonight. Uh, he is a Governor General's Bronze Medal Award recipient and a multi-award uh, winning interdisciplinary storyteller, educator, <laughs> artivist, and ever-growing interstellar tree. Quentin is the first artist ever to be commissioned by Carnegie Hall Creating Art for the 2021-2022 season based on the theme of Afrofuturism. Quentin, uh, in partnership with Javed Ja, is creating Mississauga's first black and brown artist collaboration public art piece, a dynamic archway ent entitled Rayon Cosmic Bloom, that I'm sure he's going to talk about, and created Toronto's first monument of a person of African descent stepping forward into history, the Joshua Glover Memorial. Quinton's work uh, draws on the use of connecting historical past and symbolism with futuristic elements while exploring cosmic connections, which he coined the term for, for it as Sankofa knowledge. As a scholar, he has been published in numerous journals for articles on Afrofuturism and is the co-editor of Canada's first art book on Afrofuturism Afro entitled Cosmic Underground North Side, an incantation of Black Canadian discourse and inner standings, and coined the term Rastafuturism. Currently, he's the steward of the Black Speculative Arts Movement Canada and is the artist uh, director of Astro Sankofa Arts Initiative, a collective and non-for-profit organization focused on public art production, art exhibitions, and NFTs developments and support for Afro-descendant creatives. I would like to welcome Quentin. All right, well, I go Okay, that was a temperature check. <laughs> so, uh, exactly, uh-huh. So when I say I go, I want to say I may. And basically I go is, ask, is saying that, I, are you present? Are you here? And when you say I may, you are, you are saying that you are present, you are here. So I go. I go. I go. Thank you. And uh, in the tradition of the Ewe people, which I am a descendant of, uh, we like to say, my ways on law, which you will respond and say, yo. So my ways on law is say, welcome. And you are accepting the welcome. So my ways on law. Thank you. So that's it. Um, so I'm definitely honored to be here today. And uh, I cannot start speaking without welcoming you all. And also without welcoming our ancestors. And uh, one of the things I, you know, just from the temperature, temperature check that I just did, uh, I think it's important that we have a collective understanding, understanding of what is the ancestor. So I want to ask you, 
uh, you know, anyone can feel free to let me know. What do you understand the ancestors to be? Like, how do you define ancestors? Anyone can let me know. Spirit. Okay, beautiful. Anyone else? How do you define ancestors? Fathers and mothers. Beautiful. Anyone else? Okay, so I think we can work with that definition. Also, uh, when we think about ancestors, this is not only those who came before you, but in the African, West African tradition, it's not only those who came before you, but also those who are coming after you. Uh, this is very similar to uh, indigenous thinking around seven generations, where they think about seven generations before them and seven generations after. And so this is connected to Sankofa, which I'll talk about. But more importantly, uh, I just wanted to make sure we have an understanding, understanding, and overstanding, and I'll break down those words uh, of ancestors. And so a lot of my work that I do is about ancestral connection and about uh, this journey that uh, the ancestors have taken me on um, to create visual stories about the future. And so... Uh, I'm going to start off with breaking down a couple key ideas. And then from those key ideas, I, I kind of broke in down my work into three categories, which is self-perception, looking at my work from 2010 to 2015, to community projection, which is from 2014 to 2017, and then communal reflection, which is kind of the work that I'm currently creating right now. And uh, some of these key ideas is imagineering. You might have heard this word before but just so everyone has the same working definition. Uh, technofossils. So this is a very important idea within my work. Then we have artography. So this is essentially what I do as a creative. Africa with an X. This is a, a theory that I created, uh, but I do not own it. Uh, it was given to me, as, a, as I like to say, it's a gift. And I like to share that gift with all of you today. And then we have Pan-Africanism. And from Pan-Africanism, we have Afrofuturism. And then we have Sankofanology. And all of these are going to link to the journey. So before we start the journey, I want to start a little lighthearted. So does anybody know, why don't the Black Panther and Wakandans like online shopping? Anyone? What's your answer? Take a wild guess. Why doesn't the Black Panther and Wakandans do not like online shopping? Because <laughs> they don't have computers? Because they prefer catalogs. <laughs> Meow. <laughs> ah, one more, one more, one more. Just so, you know, get y'all, get y'all warmed up. Why did the Black Panther say, what did the Black Panther say? when he was asked if he knows who Marcus Garvey is. Take a wild guess. She's like, I don't know. I probably purred. The Black Panther said, what kind of question is that? <laughs> of course we know who Marcus Garvey is. So Imagineering. Imagineering is a term, believe it or not, was trademarked by Walt Disney, but coined by Alaka, a corporation that exploited metals from Africa and the Caribbean, ironically. And uh, it refers to a speculative or imaginative creation. Technofossils is a term that comes out of the Anthropocene uh, studies and scholarship, which is the effects that human activity has on the earth and on the planet. Technofossils are human-made objects, often made out of non-natural or human-manipulated materials, that lives beyond a natural human lifespan, including cement, aloe metals, uh, and plastics. The term also refers to the remains or preservation of technology of that time or for the future. Artography. I love this word. I recently discovered this word and I was like, ah, this is, uh, like it describes everything what I'm about and, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be diving, deep diving, nose diving into this philosophy and into the scholarship. Um, and artography came out of scholarship from Rita L. Uh, L. Irwin from uh, University of BC. And it looks at the idea of an artist, researcher, and teacher, practitioner, 
simultaneously operating as one. And so how they all work together. And as such, when someone engages into artography, they are living in a space of inquiry, of curiosity. And so for me, my work is very much about creating uh, a moment of artography where you're looking at the art, but you're also learning from the art, but then also the art can teach you and you can teach the artist something. But then as a practitioner, I'm constantly in this gauge engagement of inquiry, especially as I collaborate with my ancestors. And so this brings me to African with an X. And so this relates to the black quantum futurism and ancestral networks. So X is a very interesting word in Latin, in English language. It has many sounds, but also in uh, Africa, X often represents the unknown syllable. Right, something that sonically doesn't, you know, it's it's weird, you know. For example, Osa, right? When you see it, you see it written with the X H O S A, but it has a k sound, right? A clicking sound. Uh, in Somalia, also the X has a very interesting sound that is not. I don't even want to butcher it, but the X sound is is used in multiple ways depending on what the what word comes after it. So sometimes it's used as a vowel, sometimes it's used as a consonant. Also in West Africa, it's used in multiple ways. And so Africa with an X in this context, in this definition, represents a spiritual space, the unknown space. And so I defined it in a book called Space Time Collapse. And I refer to it as a spiritual, synergistic, and metaphysical space that operates like the internet. So it's access via embedded cultural keys that exist within African medicine and artistic practices. So this idea of when you engage in rituals, like the call and response, you actually enter into the space of accessing uh, unlimited amount of knowledge. In uh, current media and in current, uh, you know, in current uh, episteme, we kind of look at the, Afri the Africa with the X as, you know, the ancestral plane also we have it referred to as the metaverse the multiverse the quantum realm these are all type of africa's with an x uh and the reason why i use africa with the x is because we all understand that africa is the creator of humanity so obviously all of our ancestors are existing in this space of the unknown and so this is different from heaven just just to let you know and so this is where your ancestors are actively engaging no matter where you come from, ethnic background, et cetera, et cetera, or race, blase, blase, because spirit has no race. And so the concept of the multiverse quantum realm is a concept of multi-realities and dimensions existing, uh, includes a possible infinite number of parallel universes. And so the concept of Sankofa, where the past, present, and future overlaps, is an interstellar multiverse belief that the African ancestors of the past and those of the future yet to manifest are with you and consciously support you uh, in your present reality, dimension, and universe. So Africa with an X, to me, is how you explain how the pyramids were built. It's not aliens. It's the ancestors from the future and ancestors from different dimensions. Like, hey, this is how you build that thing. So I just solved a, a world problem. Just, well, I didn't solve it, but the theory solves that, that issue. And so... For me, this idea of Africa with an X also speaks to this idea of why is it so hard? Why blackness is so resilient? It also speaks to the idea of, of Afrofuturism. And uh, it constantly makes me think of this quote, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. And so this leads to one of the main ideas of my work, which is Pan-Africanism. And so Pan-Africanism, uh, for me, it doesn't only relate to the idea of Pan-Africanism, how... Uh, people of the Afro diaspora and the continent are working together and we share commonalities. But it also relates to this network within the Africa with the X of how all of our ancestors are working together. And so this speaks to ancestral alignment and networking together. And uh, this idea, this download, as I call it, came from Marcus Messiah Garvey, uh, who is considered the father of Pan Africanism. And he said this quote that like shook me to the core. And then when I went to Ghana, uh, I went into this hut and I just want to tell you a quick background story. So I went into, I went into this space in Ghana, uh, in Nima. And uh, this is when I was given the term Sankofa which I'll talk about very shortly. 
And uh, the elder was like, oh, you, you made the room full. And I was like, what do you mean? It's just me and you. What is, what is this guy talking about? He's like, ah, oh, you came into the room with all your ancestors. And I can see them. They're filling the space. And they're sitting with my ancestors. So the room is full. And so when he said that to me, it made me think of this quote from Marcus Messiah Garvey, who was on the verge of recognizing how the FBI, the CIA was working against him. He was about to be in prison in Atlanta. And, uh, and he said this, to this was a, his last address to the people before they tried to dismantle the UNIA. And so he says, when I am dead, wrap the mantle of the red, the black, and the green around me, for in the new life I shall rise up and with God's grace and the blessing to lead the millions of the heights in the triumph that you well know. Look for me in the whirlwind or a storm. Look for me all around you, for with God's grace I shall come back with countless millions of black men and women who have died in America, those who have died in the West Indies, those who have died in Africa, to aid you in your fight, in your fight for liberty, freedom, and life. I don't know if, if, that's, if that doesn't sound like a threat. I don't know what it is. Um, and he did that. You know, he did that. When you look at majority of the African flags, they actually represent the red, black, and green, including Ghana, uh, Ethiopia, many countries across Africa, embedding um, the millions of ancestors who are fighting for our liberty. And so this relates to Afrofuturism because it's about how our ancestors are helping, constantly working in alignment with other ancestors to help us to have a future. And so what is Afrofuturism? So a lot of people look at the definition from Mark Derry. You're going to hear from me right now. Do not ever do that ever again. If you see a definition from Mark Derry about Afrofuturism, just dismiss it. Uh, it is not a definition. I say it's a translation of a synergy. Um, the definition from Yatasha Womack in 2014 is a really great uh, attempt to translate what Afrofuturism is. And then uh, later on, Isaiah Lavender III also translated, uh, gave a definition of Afrofuturism. Um, but before I give a definition of Afrofuturism, I want to show you my introduction to the idea of Afrofuturism. When I start to think about blackness in the future and the possibilities of what it could look like. And I'm curious to know if anyone knows this movie. Uh, does anybody know what movie this is? Fifth Element. So, that was my introduction to Afrofuturism. I was like, yo, the president of the Galactic Empire is a black man. What? And then in this one minute clip alone, I heard six different accents from different black people. I was just like, yo, this is mind boggling. Not everyone's British. Not everyone is, is American. Not everyone is speaking one uh, dialect. It was just mind boggling. It just showed me, it was just like really exciting to see almost like my family, like a representation of my family in the future, you know, and then seeing them in different empowering roles was just uh, really really uh, interesting. But then I started to think about, okay, what type of representations uh, can we have then? How can I expand my own imagination? And so for me, my definition of Afrofuturism is Afrofuturism is an expansion of blackness, a time-bending collage of legacies. Afrofuturism is a pan-African frequency that has manifested in the forms of being an arts movement, praxis, methodology, and a ways of thinking about the creative ways that all living things can heal. What did I say? All 
All living things can heal. Can we all say that together? So this is like fungi to extraterrestrial beings, all living things, because this is all within African pantheology. And so with all living things can heal, they can continue to exist, evolve, and f or fractal from an Afrocentric lens. Those ways can be precise, hypothetical, science fiction, speculative, fantasy, or prophetic. And so this is an amalgamation of definitions, but mainly what I received when I was on the continent of, uh, you know, essentially they said, if, if nothing can heal, nothing can have a future. We are constantly in a space of healing, which is why we sleep, right? Which is why we need rest, which is why we need food. This is all a part of healing. So if we're not thinking about all those things holistically, then what is Afrofuturism in a practical form? And so, um, Ronaldo Anderson, in his book, Afrofuturism 2.0, which I'm also featured in, The Rise of Astral Blackness, and also Isaiah Lavender, Afrofuturism Rising, they kind of outline five dimensions of Afrofuturism, what they call Afrofuturism 2.0, because it's no longer linked to the former definition that Mark Derry put out. And in this five dimensions, they highlight metaphysics, aesthetics, theoretical and applied science, social science, and programmatic spaces. And so metaphysics touches on the meanings of existence, the function of knowledge, and the origin and structure of the universe, and of course, spirituality. Aesthetics, this is everything from anthropomorphic, art, music, literature, and performance. So uh, literally, what are the aesthetics that gives us a sense of the future, you know? Um, so for example, in the clip from, fi uh, from Fifth Dimension, you had the little alien things dropping off the, space, the, the spaceship. We had the futuristic city, all these things are aesthetics. Um, the theoretical and applied science, so the archaeology, math, physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, and computer science, architecture, engineering, medicine, and agriculture. The social science, so what are the, what are the, what are the implications on society? So psychology, anthropology, psychology, uh, political, science, and history, and then we have programmatic spaces like this one. So how is the information to help build towards a better future being disseminated? So this can happen in exhibitions, community organizations, online forums and special salons or labs or artist talks. And so Ronaldo Anderson in his book says, and in the 21st century, it is no longer bound to its original definition as a term once dealing with cultural, aesthetic and digital divide, but has been brought in to, know, to be known as also as a philosophy of science, metaphysics and geopolitics. And so, from Afrofuturism, from Pan-Africanism to Afrofuturism, it brings us to Sankofanology. Oh, sorry. So before we get to Sankofanology, there are two dynamics which I describe out of Afrofuturism. There is a secular Afrofuturism and a rooted rhizomatic Afrofuturism. So these are two different Afrofuturisms. So, you know, I like to distinguish these things as a scholar. So the secular is more about entertainment and aesthetic and is more focused on aesthetic. It lacks uh, intentions on tangibility, uh, contains the white savior or black skin white mass complex, and carries on a black on black violence tropes and encourages division. So that's more secular. On a tangible holistic aspect, we're looking at rooted rhizomatic, where it's immediately utility focused, has tangibility and social benefits, refers or has references to continental African history, principles, and does not center whiteness, capitalism, or patriarchy, or put a black face on it. And so, for me, it's very important to be intentional with my work, especially because, uh, and I'll speak about this more, the sense of accountability that I have with the work that I'm putting out because of the elders who have given me the knowledge that I have to, uh, to share with all of you and disseminate with, uh, with my community. And so I want to show you this clip, and I want to hear from you what you think where do you think it lands in these two afrofuturisms how do you know i'm real yeah i'm not real i'm just like you you don't exist in this society if you did your people wouldn't be seeking equal rights you're not real if you were you'd have some status among the nations of the world so we're both myths i do not come to you as a reality i come to you as the myth because that's what black people are, myths. 
she's like, yeah, yeah, okay. Thoughts? Agree, disagree, and do you think this is an example of secular or rhizomatic? You think it's secular? Why? Mm, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, so it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid because he's challenging the idea of blackness and he's letting people know that blackness is a myth. But then also he's, he's showing up in a way that does kind of create a stereotype, right? Of like the Afrofuturist dressed up, you know, all kind of funky. Um, but then also speaking to the stereotype of what blackness uh, could be, right? Um, but it's really interesting, this idea of the black myth. And that really had me complex. And so Sun Ra for me is like a very main reference point when I look at going towards a rooted Afrofuturism from a Western standpoint to get me more rooted in a continental Pan-African standpoint. Um, Sun Ra and June, and June Tyson are two people who really brought this idea of like you have to look back to Africa and root it back into African principles like Ma'at, like uh, Ubuntu and Sankofa. And so they look at the roots of Afrofuturism being, for them, uh, Ethiopia, Alkabalan, uh, cosmology and metaphysics. So again, they're speaking about the, the spiritual. Um, and then both of them emphasize on this idea of when they talk about space as a place, they're not talking about outer space, they're talking about the African with the X space a spiritual space. So when they say space is a place, they're not talking about just the galaxies, they're talking about a spiritual space. And that's because they see themselves as being connected to the galaxy. Does that make sense? And so when you see certain Afrofuturistic works, especially my own, that has some of these galactic elements, it's more about a commentary on spirituality and that, that Africa with an X space, that unknown space. And so rooted in rhizomatic Afrofuturism and Afrofuturistic work is always about liberation, sovereignty, healing, and growing the well-being of African people at home and abroad and the collective earth sea community, regardless of what other people, nations, or governments are doing or trying to do. Rooted slash rhizomatic Afrofuturism is not centered in a conflict and fantasy, but tangible purposes and usage, just as the African ancestors done before. And so what I mean by that is like things like the Negro spiritual. Those weren't just for entertainment, right? We know that those were for upliftment of the enslaved Africans to actually connect them back to the drum patterns from West Africa where they came from so they remember, so they can pass those things on when the drum was banned by the British and by the Spanish. We also know that a lot of those songs actually have their roots within West Africa. So, and then also some of them were actually escape plans embedded into those songs. So again, it's about liberation. It's also about healing. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then another distinction I want to make is with the rooted, um, rooted kind of speaks to the diaspora, the African diaspora, right? We're trying to reconnect to where we came from. Rhizomatic is more speaking to the continental, right? They already are connected to the roots, and so the rhizomatic is them spreading out those roots, right, and reaching back to the continent, which we see happening right now, which is really interesting. And I know I'm going on a tangent, but yeah, what's happening with Afrobeats? with Soka, with, uh, with even house music, with Beyonce, shout out to Beyonce. Um, you know, we, we see that, that rhizomatic aspect happening between the continent and the diaspora. And so that brings me to Sanko phonology. And this is the main concept that informs our work and embeds all these ideas. And so in 2017, I went to Ghana. And, uh, and in Ghana, like I said, I had this reasoning with the elders. Uh, in Rastafari culture and community, we call this grounding, right? We had a grounding where you're literally sitting on the ground, so oftentimes around a fire, and, uh, and everyone's sharing ideas. And you have to be invited to speak. And I was invited to speak. And, um, and I was just speaking about, you know, the disconnect between me being of Jamaican descent and many people who I know uh, want to connect back to Africa but don't really know what is that best entry point? And, you know, they go, oh, you know, you ask me, do you, have the, do you have a degree? I go, yeah, I have my bachelor's degree in fine arts. Okay, show me your work. I go, I show them. 
ah, okay, okay. And then they, they ask me, what do I study? I go, oh, you know, I study this and study that. He goes, ah, you should study Sankofa. In fact, everyone should study, study Sankofa. You have to study where you came from to know where you're going. And he's like, ah, you should treat it like biology, psychology, all these ologies. I go, okay, maybe you're onto something. And then by the end of the night, he goes, he pulled me aside, the elder pulled me aside and said, I want you to spread this idea of Sankofa, right? And encourage people to learn from Sankofa. And so here I am doing it. And, um, and then the same message was repeated when I did a naming ceremony in, uh, in Kamasi, in North, in, North, uh, in North Ghana, where I was given a robe and given a new name based on a day name, Kofi, which is the day of Friday when, when I was born. And uh, the full name is uh, Kofi Asafa Kente. And it's the idea that I bring people together through my work. And he didn't even know I was an artist, so he was onto something. Again, ancestors working together. And so Sankofa is uh, an ancient symbol that originates with the Akan people of uh, Ghana and Ivory Coast. And uh, these two symbols are semiotics that represents uh, a message about not forgetting. San, without, Kofa, forgetting, without forgetting. And uh, the proverb that goes with Sankofa, it is, it is not taboo to go and get what was forgotten. And it has two symbols for Sankofa. There was a Sankofa bird, and then the Sankofa, the heart symbol, which is also known as Dua. Now, the bird represents the physical ways that we learn from the past, the physical ways that we can learn from our ancestors. So this can be through objects, this can be through people, this could be through lessons, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea is that we learn from the past to inform the present, to build towards the future. So again, that Afrofuturism aspect. So now the Dua, and another interesting thing is, this symbol is actually the original heart symbol. So every time you send that emoji, that's coming from the Akan people, if you didn't know that. For whatever reason, colonization decided to cut the tail off and cut off the intentions, which obviously, without their circulation, the heart is dead. So, But uh, Sankofa Dua represents the way that we learn from our internal spirit, an internal ancestral space, so the Africa with an X, and bring that into understanding, wisdom, insight, and outwards into action. And so... Again, this word comes up, understanding. So, so when you understand, according to Rasta people, when you understand something, you're under the influence of that information. And so that information can control you. When you understand something, you're not really being able to make use of that information. According, according to, Rasta to Rasta culture. So you don't, don't want to understand, understand something. When you, when you overstand, overstand something, something, you are now, now almost like this mat. You are, you are now, now above the information, and you can now determine what, what to do with that information. Like Just like this mat, I can determine, do I want to place it here? Do I want to roll it up and tape it with me? Et cetera, et cetera. When you, when you understand, understand something, something, it means your ancestors, ancestors can now use that information. It's now a spiritual comprehension. And so, one of the things my grandfather used to always say is, do you overstand or understand? So do you understand or understand? All right. Glad you understand. And so Sankofa then relates to Sankofa knowledge, which is the practice of using Sankofa. So the ology, meaning the study of a science or a theory of, so when you put it together, Sankofa is a study and theory of Sankofa without forgetting. So Sankofa knowledge is the study and analysis of a Pan-African application, practice, dubbing, remixing, and applied science of using West African concepts of Sankofa to demonstrate that time does not exist on a singular dimension, so Africa with an X, uh, but rather the African past, present, and future are all interconnected and overlaps. For me, my work is embedded, embedded in all of my work is about Sankofa knowledge. And it wasn't until recently that I realized, even in my self-exploration uh, stage, where I was looking at uh, my own self, um, my own self-identity and self-reflection, Sankofa knowledge was still there, right? Understanding it and knowing myself. This brings us to the work, right? So again, the three categories that we're looking at, the first category is self-perception. And so for me, in my early works, my early working things, you know, I was really exploring different mediums, exploring different ways that I understood who I was uh, and my connection to my African roots and even like where we came from and, and everything was just about uh, research. 
right? And how that research then turned into art. And then in that process, in that collaboration, I was learning and teaching things about myself and teaching other people about me. And so all of it changed when I got the Governor General Award. And so a bit, of my, a bit about my story is I was a high school dropout. I dropped out at 16. I was involved in a lot of what we call badness. You know, I wasn't making the best decisions. And um, when I got roughly around 20, so five years later, I decided to, maybe I should get my high school diploma. And in doing so, I did a fast track program. And, um, and in that fast track program, somehow, some ancestors alignment, that's, all I, I just, that's the only way I can put it. Because my whole life, teachers told me I was dumb. I, I, was, I was labeled as having dyslexia, uh, ADHD, the whole nine yards. Somehow, I ended up on the honor roll. And uh, got my graduation, with, got enough credits to give, uh, get my graduation within two years. And during that time period, I was exploring art. And art was like the way I could make sense of, of the world. Right? When I had a math equation, I will draw it out, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I was given the Governor General Academic Medal, it changed everything. Because one, I saw the check. And I was like, ooh, money. You know what I mean? But then I didn't realize that that money had to go towards your education. I was like, ah, oh, damn. You know, it's a, it a good check. So I was like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? And so uh, in that moment, I had to make a decision. Am I going to pursue a post-secondary education or do something else? And uh, as, as history has shown, I decided to pursue my post-academic post uh, scholarship. And so one of the things I was really trying to make sense of it was the trauma that I had. The trauma that I had of things that I saw uh, and, and a lot of my childhood trauma. So a lot of my early works was exploring that, that situation, the different situations I went through um, and the different horrors. And then also piecing together and making sense of, of my experiences. And so I was exploring a lot of acrylic and oil, mixing acrylic oil and aerosol and you know, kind of mixing these worlds together. And uh, this is one of my, my, one of the only paintings that I had to enter into OCAD. This was the painting that I had to go into OCAD. I was like, hey, this is a, hey, this is all I have. I have a bunch of drawings. Take me or not. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, take it or leave it. And uh, quick story time. Um, so the way that OCAD works is that they do portfolio reviews. And in that portfolio review, they will tell you, uh, good luck next time or Maybe we'll consider you. We'll let you know in a couple of weeks if you get a letter. But most likely, you might not get it in. And, um, and I know I applied. So I had a, I had a, a very, very, very generous uh, professor, uh, teacher. Uh, at that time, I was, I was a TA at George Brown. And um, he, he was the one who submitted my application to OCAD. And he's like, hey, Quentin, I got you an interview. Paid for it. Don't worry. Just show up. And I was like, listen, I ain't, I ain't got no finished work, nothing. And uh, I was there, and then I seen all these kids with, like, huge carts of paintings. Like, this one kid had, like, a chauffeur, and he's bringing in these large paintings. I was like, oh, there's no way. I only had a picture of this painting, uh, a couple murals, and this drawings. I was like, there's no way I'm getting into school. And I saw how much tuition was. I was like, oh, there's no way. I was like, yeah, I had that, 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 that check. But I'm like, do I actually want to use that check on this thing? I'm like, I don't know. So I got my interview. And the first interview went well, and that was for the design program. Then I had another interview with the art program. And uh, the guy, gentleman, went through my book, went through my sketchbook. He looked at the pictures that I had. These pictures I printed on my shopper's drug mart, so they weren't that good. And uh, he looked at me and said, do you think you could be racist? I was like, oh, man. Is this white guy really asking me if I could be racist? I was like, oh my gosh, we're about to fight right now. I'm like, it's about to go down. I'm definitely not going to the school because I'm going to jail. And, um, and in that moment, you know, I kind of just humbled myself and I, and I said, no, I can't be racist, you know, based on the power structure of racism and how racism operates. There's no system that I control that can allow me to actually exercise racism. I can only practice discrimination. And he looks at me and goes, oh, that's a good answer. But I think we all can be racist. I go, okay. All right. Took my book from him. I'm like, I'm out of here. Strolling. And then uh, 
as I was going in the elevator, he, he ran up to me. He's like, listen, I look forward to having you in my class. I was like, yo, this guy's crazy. I was like, white people are crazy. So the thing that was really interesting about this painting was another part of my story is growing up in Rexdale, I didn't know I was black. And that sounds weird to some people, but think about it. I grew up around all Jamaicans and a bunch of different African people, Somali, Nigerian, Ghana. Uh, we had a couple people from, uh, from South Africa, but majority everyone in my neighborhood was black at growing up. And then whenever I left my neighborhood, it was always my family. My family's a really big family. I have uh, a whole bunch of uncles and aunties. So I wasn't really exposed to the idea of being treated differently based on how I looked until, until I was graduating high school. In high school, all my teachers were black. But it just didn't occur to me that black was a thing. Why? Because coming from a Jamaican household, going to Jamaica often, lived in Jamaica briefly, it's not a thing that you say to someone. Like, you don't go around and say, I'm a black reggae artist. Doesn't that sound weird? Like, imagine Bob Marley and black. I'm a black reggae artist. It's just everyone around you looks like you, you know? And so that concept of being the other didn't occur until I graduated high school. And, uh, and so this idea of the Gemini, because I was born in June, was really a reflection on this idea of racism, the difference in, in terms of like now being a man and recognizing this black and white, uh, this black and white world, and then the difference of like wanting to recapture my childhood, right? And, and this idea of like wanting to be free, carefree, liberated, um, you know, and, and think about the future being fun and, and full of wonders like a child. And so to me, now, years later, looking back at this work, digging it back up, I was like, oh, this is Sankofanology, right? I'm looking at the present, but then I'm also reflecting on my past, right? And that's how I got to understand myself, know myself, which is a principle in my art. Um, in 2011, after I got all these bursaries for my graduation, took some of that money, traveled to South Africa. And in going to South Africa, I underwent several rituals. And then, you know, I made this painting based off of some of the, the ceremonies I got to attend. And this is a mural that I made. Um, this is an art piece I made of Toni Morrison because her work really was like really foundational for me um, early in my, in my stages. And I was really interested in this idea of mark making and this idea of permanence. Because um, I felt canvas was really flimsy. I felt canvas was, was something that was easy to get damaged, especially living in a small, in a small uh, apartment. Um, I actually used to use my iron board as, a, as an easel. And my siblings, who didn't care for art, would just knock it off. And so the canvas always would get dented and, you know, uh, uh, many times uh, torn. So the wood was a lot stronger. So I was really interested in this idea of etching, which then led me into sculpture. And so this is a piece that I made, of course, uh, inspired by my trip to South Africa. And then this is uh, some aerosol work. Uh, at that time, I was really interested in this idea of... of uh, exploring this idea of within graffiti and street art, how you put your name everywhere, right? And how you kind of develop your, your identity through street art culture. So for me, I was kind of looking at this idea of like using the name Gears, you know, how I'm always changing gears and how I felt like I'm switching gears and I'm breaking the gear of white supremacy. I, I just added that now recently. Um, but you know, I felt like I was thinking about that back then, but I want to show you a quick clip of younger Quentin 10 years ago. Let's hear. My name is Quentin Rossetti, um, also AKA, my real name is Quentin Lindsay. I'm here, a part of the 8th Planet, working for Art Starts. Right now, we're working on Mural, and basically how I got involved with Art Starts was, I was working with them last year, and my mentor and one of my close friends, Daniel McCallum, he actually led me to Art Starts because he was familiar with the work. He told me to apply for a job, apply for the job, got the job, and then it was just like a rolling stone from there, you know? And so now again, I'm back where I start some, we're working on a mural to accommodate the Lawrence Heights and Neptune area. And the experience so far has been, it's really different from last year, especially the location, especially for um, the people that we're doing it for. And 
special conditions that we're working in, in the sense of Lawrence Heights and Neptunes, they're not getting along right now, so it's, it's hard for actually to build up a, a, a sense of community when the community is being torn apart. So hopefully, we're using this part to um, become kind of like a mediator between the two that's shooting, two neighborhoods that's shooting. And so right now, we're putting a lot of heart, a lot of um, ideology of peacemaking and things that can help um, to communities come back together. Really. So it's a real challenge. Yeah, I'm having fun. Okay. So, coming from Rexdale, I'm working in a rival neighborhood. And uh, and I literally wa went walked up to like a group of like you know, tough looking guys. And I said, yo, who runs this neighborhood? And they're like, yo, who are you? You know, very aggressive. And I was like, listen, I want to get permission from the OG to do this mural. And I just want to ensure that there's no issues because I know that these two sides are feuding. And they're like, oh, what kind of mural? And I'm like, well, you can tell me what kind of mural you want it to be. And everyone's like, oh, well, I want this. I want that. And they got all excited about having themselves represented in this art piece. And so I did the same thing for the other block, which is like just a couple of houses, a couple of complexes down. Who's the OG of this neighborhood? They were less aggressive. They directed me to the person. And, uh, and it still just so happened that his nephew was involved in the project. So he was more open and was like, okay, cool. I actually respect that, you know, you, you came and reached out. And then from there, they started to come and see what we we're doing. And from there, I was like, okay, well, if they're coming to see what we're doing, what happens if they both come at the same time? And I was like, okay, well, I got to set it up for this to be a neutral space for both neighborhoods to be able to come without any, any issues. And so I was like, okay, let me recruit the youth from both sides. And so this project that was at Yorkdale um, really showed me the power of art because what actually happened from that was the two rival neighborhoods actually called a truce. And that truce lasts for about two years um, before, you know, some unfortunate things happen. But, um, but it showed me how, how art can bring people together. And so it made me really think about, okay, well, what is my role in doing this? Because everyone else who's working with me at Art Starts never had this idea. And so that led me to doing more murals uh, with, intentional, uh, with intentional means to bring communities together. This is another uh, mural that I did in collaboration with Steve uh, Harrison from California at the Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. And we brought youth from uh, Bleakers on Shepherd, I mean, uh, on Sherburne, and youth from Regent Park. We brought them together to this community center and had them work together. And uh, that gentleman with the Toronto Raptors uh, shirt with the hat on right beside the future, that's actually me. And so uh, later on, I went to Belize and continued to do this uh, idea of public art and public engagement. And I really loved the experience. I uh, got to work with the community there, work with the youth there, and really think about this idea of how to share love, spread love, and expand how they saw art functioning within their work, I mean, within their community. And so this led to my next stage in my, in my, in my art career and journey, which was community projection. And so during this time, I started to explore a lot more with digital art. Also during this time, I fell in love. And I thought the woman who I was seeing was gonna be the, you know, the person of my future. And so I started to think about my own future and the type of legacy I want to have. And so I was really interested in this idea of uh, my legacy being a part of, or, or my future being a part of uh, this idea of reminding people to reconnect to their own spirit and, and recenter uh, what their strength within them and their story, right? Everyone has a story. Every story is important. So reconnect to that. Reground your, ground yourself in that truth. And so I was really interested in uh, reinterpreting European um, artworks and, and reinterpreting the Renaissance works and, and Baroque and Rococo because during that time period, colonization was kicking and racism was live and rampant. And so I was like, well, what a, best, what a good way to decolonize some of these works by reinterpreting them. 
and having black representation. So this is all amino restitution. And also during this time period, I was uh, exploring digital art more. So this gave birth to my, my series called Adams of Eve. And the idea behind that work was seeing the black skin as something that's valuable, right? And so breaking it down to atomic structure. And at this time, I was also really interested in African fractals, which is a theory by Ron Eglish, um, Eglish who was talking about African fractals existing in all things. And I'll, spot, I'll show you another example of African fractals within my work. But it related a lot to mathematical equations and algorithms, but how a lot of these things are in the basis of like cultures that use divination as, as a form of connecting to the ancestors, but also connecting to ways that they can project towards the future and make decisions. And so I was thinking about how can we think about the spirituality within the black skin and project towards protecting our bodies, protecting um, our, our, our skin folks, kin folks. And so this is Adams of Eve and Wing. And so during this time period, I was also interested in West African drumming. And I went to Haiti at that time and, and traveled throughout the Caribbean, exploring different drumming practices as it related to ritual and as it related to divination. So how did some of these syncopated um, African rhythms actually related to um, ways of, of speaking to the future and connecting to the future and also how the dances told stories. So all of this was all about research, researching and teaching myself uh, some of these ancient knowledges and how I can connect them into visual storytelling. And then I got really interested in uh, this idea of, of, of permanence. Um, coming from Jamaica, there are tons of monuments about our history across the continent. And also during that time, like I said, I was traveling and I was like, oh, wow, there's so many monuments of African history. And also during that time, I was getting deeper into Rastafari and I came across this quote, any monument to be left for our people to be permanent must be erected upon spiritual foundations. And that was said by His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie. And that reminded me of a quote by Marcus Messiah Garvey where he said, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And so during that time period, I was like, oh, well, where are the monuments in Toronto? Where are the monuments in Canada? And lo and behold, I realized that there was none. And so when I realized that there was no monuments in Toronto, I realized a part of that journey was first to see myself as a monument and see myself as something of importance to then be able to project towards my community the value of having these things represented. And so also during that time period, I learned about someone named Matthew da Costa. How many of you know who Matthew da Costa is? So just know that the system has failed you if you do not know who Matthew da Costa is. Matthew da Costa is a very important translator. He was the first uh, documented black person in Canada who was not an enslaved person. During 1605, he came with, uh, he, was, he was documented as coming with Samuel du Champlain's uh, exploration party. But he knew the language of the Mi'kmaq people and many indigenous peoples from all the way from New Brunswick and Nova Scotia all the way into Quebec. So how can someone know the language of a group of people before anyone else? How could that happen? Anyone? Any wild guesses? Ancestors, what else? What are the theories we have? There's something much more practical than that. Yeah, he came here before. He had to come here before to know these multiple languages. Matthew da Costa came with his own boat of Moors. So he was hired by the Dutch, the English, I mean, sorry, the Dutch and the, and the Spaniards and the French. So he clearly knew the land. He clearly must have lived amongst the people. And so there must have been some ancestral alignment for him to be able to be like, hey, you can hire me to translate these languages for these people because I already know them. They already know me. I already know the land. So the fact that a lot of this is absent from history is wild. The fact that we're not taught this in school that about this black man uh, is, is really uh, crazy for me. Also, another book that really influenced my work was uh, Octavia Butler, uh, Seed to Harvest. Again, speaking to this idea of Africa with an X, about this idea of having uh, telepathic connected connections to other other people of your, of, your, of, your, of your background and ethnic group. And so for this piece, Baba Garvey feeling like Ezekiel, 
This was a translation, a remix of uh, of a bus of Queen of Vic- uh, sorry, of the Goddess of Victory, a Greek bus. And so I decided to represent myself as that goddess because recognizing that uh, the creative spirit is a feminine energy. And so it was me embracing my feminine energy as a creative. And I'm kind of spewing out uh, all the negativity that I felt like I was being told to swallow through history and through my experience in my undergrad. Uh, during my undergrad, my professor told me if I make another digital art piece, uh, he will fill me. I was, I was happy. I was like, oh, you're going you go, you to fill me. Listen, I didn't have to pay. I got, I got this Governor General Award that's paying for my university, so fill me. I'll just come back again with a million people, you know, Marcus Garvey, that quote. And so this art piece is called Baba Garvey Feeling Like Ezekiel. And I decided to show this art piece as my thesis piece at OCAD. And uh, lo and behold, I ended up being nominated for seven awards in seven different categories. And that was the first time that uh, that happened at OCAD. Even though I didn't win, I was a runner-up in several. Uh, it was the first time that they were undecisive, right? Because they're like, is it a painting? Is it, is it digital art? Is it a sculpture? We don't know. Is it a photograph? They were just, you know, and I was like, good, it's everything. It's all of that. And so that led me down this road of realizing different ways that I can use sculpture and digital mediums to explore multiple ideas and, again, call upon uh, different African references um, all into my work um, in a record amount of time and in a cost-efficient way. And so during this time period, I was also exploring bronze sculptures and 3D printing simultaneously. And so in creating these works and doing research and referencing back to African history and, and, and digging deeper into my roots, one, I learned that my great, great, great grandfather was a blacksmith. So I was like, oh, that's, that's mind boggling. Um, so going through the records and learning that he was a blacksmith was, was really, um, yeah, just really opened my eyes to the possibilities of things I could do. Um, and the fact that, that my interest in sculpture was connected to a lineage, blood, blood memory in a lot of ways. But then it, it led me to dig deeper into monument making. Because I was like, it doesn't make sense that we call European art classical art when Rome and Greece came after Kemet. And they were influenced by the Nubians. So I was like, ah. Something doesn't add, it, the math is not mathing, as we like to say today. And so I realized monuments are sankophological san, san practices, meaning when you see a monument, it's about reminding you about something about the past, right? You learn from these monuments in the present, and they are meant for the future. So that's sankophonology. And that meant if monument making comes from Africa, because Africa is the cradle of civilization, and the Greek and Romans, where we call this classical form, they got that inspiration from them, then that means monuments equals being an Afrofuturistic practice, no? And so I started to look into this history, how the Greek and Romans learned from Kemet and Ethiopia, and how in those spaces, they were meant, monuments were used to preserve messages as a reminder of foretelling of history, ideas, and values, and meant to connect people to the past with the future, right? Egyptian pharaohs uh, representing themselves in an ideal manner with different, icon uh, uh, different icons and iconography for the next generation. They want to be remembered for generations to come, right? So that's, that's futurism. Also, the, the, uh, a lot of African monuments demonstrated divine or supernatural power, intelligence, and ingenuity, and representation is about relativity to inspire. And so that led me to the Nuk people and the Nuk terracottas of Benin and how they were exploring these ideas in their works um, from 15,000 BC. And then, of course, Kemet, the Kemetic region in Sudan, again, 1,000 BC, almost five centuries before the Greek or Romans. And so also, again, looking at the inspiration of my Jamaican roots, again, these are different examples of monuments across Jamaica. And I was really inspired by this idea of like, there are so many monuments of Marcus Messiah Garvey. So I'm like, clearly there's something there. And that led me deeper into uh, this ancestral alignment of remembering to look back to Africa for my inspiration. And so a lot of my work, my later work in my, in my third stage, I would say, 
was inspired by these trips going back to Africa, going to Ghana, going to Zimbabwe, and um, and seeing the monuments there, right? So all these monuments of uh, Nelson Mandela and the different ways they represented him. Um, this is me in Ghana in 2017. And all the monuments that they had there. And so it led me to being like, being on fire, essentially, of like, being like, oh my gosh, I need to bring this back to Canada. But then first I started to explore it in my work. I started to explore these ideas in my work. And 2017 was a very crucial point uh, in my career. It was a crucial point because I started to look at other black artists who were making monuments in the West. So people like Augusta Savage, people like Ed DeWhite, who's currently my mentor. Uh, he's, a, he, he's an astronaut who turned into an artist, which is like, his story is amazing. Uh, Kumi Samuels, who I met in Ghana. Basil Watson, who I met um, virtually. But he's of Jamaican descent and he made a lot of monuments in Jamaica. So just seeing this representation was like, oh my gosh, where are the monument makers, black monument makers of Canada? Where are they at? And so that made me realize the underrepresentation of monuments in Canada. And so in Canada, currently, there's now 19. So there's two new monuments that have been created since I made this presentation, since I made this uh, that slide. We well, can see there's a large dispersion of the first monument in Vancouver being in 1927, and the one that follows it is in 1988. So if you do the math, it's quite some time between representation. Um, and so these are some of the different monuments around Canada of black people. And I also made a Facebook group, and, uh, and from that Facebook, Facebook group uh, or Facebook page, I got a lot of great ideas from different people sending me different, uh, different representations of monuments around the world of black people that they think should exist in Canada. So in terms of the 70 monuments that exist across uh, Canada of black representation, just to give you a context of how this is problematic, in Toronto, I mean, sorry, in Ottawa alone, on Parliament Hill, they have over 20 bronze statues, all dedicated to colonial figures. So just on Parliament Hill alone in Ottawa, there are more representations of colonial figures than there are black representation across Canada. Also in Queen's Park, where I'm actually gonna be creating a monument uh, in, in 2024 of Lincoln M. Alexander, um, there are over 20 monuments dedicated, dedicated to colonial figures and Actually, I'll be the first artist, first contemporary artist to create a monument there in over 100 years. So, again, this idea of, of uh, challenging anti-black racism and challenging representation, but also doing this for the future. And so, Charmaine Nelson, Dr. Charmaine Nelson, spoke about this underrepresentation of monuments as a form of erasure. She says the lack of black representation is a systemic form of erasure, and she speaks about this in several essays especially the representation of black female subjects in Western art and sculpting the black female subject in the 19th century America and towards an African Canadian art history of how they erase black women representation. And so Dr. Nelson really outlines how this has a psychological effect on the massive, right? Uh, on both black people and non-black folks. For black folks, it has a psychological effect on how we see ourselves on our ability to have confidence in how we can achieve or what we can achieve. And then for non-black folks, it's the, it's the undervaluing of, these, of, of black people, right? Thinking that we haven't made any contributions to Canada, any, haven't made any contribution to society as a whole. So this underrepresentation has a psychological effect on both sides. And so out of 17 monuments sites across Canada, the underrepresentation of black Canadian born so there's a there's a large underrepresentation of black canadian born historical figures as most of them are of american people who came to canada uh and there's also there's not enough reflection of canadian national figures uh most of the locations of where these monuments are located including the one i made is not in a highly visible site uh there's not enough monuments done by black sculptors who are canadian born or based on the second one to make one um out of those 17. And there's not enough women sculptors or black women subjects. Uh, there's no monuments 
of or done by queer, trans, or non-binary persons, and no monuments that speak to intersectional histories between black and indigenous people of colors and communities. And overall, with all these 17 monuments, the little deggy deggy number of monuments that we have, majority of them are often vandalized and defaced. Most recently, the Harriet Tubman bus on October 20, uh, October 2020-21. It was, uh, it was, it was basically broken um, and knocked off its pedestal. And the Harry Jerome sculpture on March 2020, 2021. Um, and also the, also the Oscar Peterson also happened to be vandalized almost yearly. So all these things speak to this idea of anti-black racism that still exists here in Canada. So out of those 17 monuments, now 19, still only five of them are bust. So there's not a lot of full figure representations. Uh, four of them are black people born in Canada. So Harry Jerome, Oscar Peterson, Duran Lewis, uh, Terrence Tiger, uh, Warrington in Liverpool, Nova Scotia. Out of these four monument sites, uh, out of the 17, now 19, there's only four monument sites of black women. Now there's five. Uh, there's Duran E. Lewis in Nova Scotia, Sur uh, Suzanne St. Blair, who's not Canadian, she's from Haiti. Uh, there are two uh, sculptures of Harriet Tubman, and now there are three sculptures of Mary Shan Carey. Again, out of these five women that were represented, only one of them were born here in Canada. So again, this underrepresentation of black Canadian women exists. And then out of these 17 monuments, now 19, only five of them were made by black artists. Ed Dwight, Artist Lane, and uh, Ancolise Gregory, Dominique Denary, and myself. And that still exists. Actually, sorry. And now the sixth one is uh, my brother. Um, I'm losing his name. My Nigerian brother who is making the art piece of uh, the jazz musician. And when I remember his name, Ad Abiola Iboya. Yes, he is the sixth person, sixth black person. And again, he's not Canadian born. So I'm the second Canadian black born uh, person to make a monument in Canada. And so these are the different monuments that exist. And this is the sixth one in Ontario. So Ed Dwight. We have Artist Lane. We have Marianne Chad Carey in Chatham. And so these are the different monuments made by black people. And then I'll talk about mine shortly. So through the explore, exploration of, through learning about all this information and having all this data, this led me into, led me wanting to represent people of my neighborhood, represent young people and show them that they, are the, they themselves are important. And so this led me into doing 3D artworks, 3D scans, of young people um, represented as monuments. Because at that time, I didn't have the money. So this is 2015. And then also, I put them into collage works as well. And I was taking monuments that I saw on my travels through Ghana, through, through, uh, throughout the African diaspora and the continent, and also put them into collage because I wanted the community to see themselves reflected in these works. And then also I made this art piece of uh, a, tri a, a tribute to Chadwick Boseman, which was commissioned by Marvel. Another art piece, because Marvel had that first one, so I was like, let me make a second one, so I can use it however I see fit, but now I can use both of them. And so, in, in this exploration, I also wanted to explore a spiritual side to it. And so this art piece, uh, I reimagined the Canadian National, the exhibition place, Gateway, as having an African woman on top, and then having different African representations. You have a Pan-African flag, and then tributes to the Raptors. And then so I wanted to make all these little subtle uh, connections to spirituality, but then also to uh, placemaking. And so from that, I, I, again, I wanted to re- uh, re-explore this idea of remixing um, European representations with black people. Uh, if you did not know, the goddess Nike, uh, which is found in Greek, Greco-Roman uh, references, actually originates from the Yoruba, the Yoruba people. So the original representation of the goddess of victory 
comes from the Yoruba people, so I wanted to represent uh, the statue as a Yoruba woman. And so, speaking about African fractals, um, this was something I started to re-explore into my work, especially with the monument making. So, places of emphasis using the golden helix and uh, the golden spiral, which uh, Ron Eiglish actually said that uh, the continent itself is in the shape of a golden spiral. So, again, using fractals and uh, this idea of, of ge uh, geometry and perfect symmetry, uh, symmetry. And so, both of these are uh, pieces at Columbia and McGill University were supposed to be um, of Queen Victoria, but again, they represented an idea of Queen Victoria as the goddess of victory, and then I remixed it uh, with an African woman. Also, another thing I want to point out is in my work, I often will put uh, Giz, Amaric, um, almost as, not almost, but similar to how uh, the Renaissance used Latin. I was looking at what is the Latin equivalent in, in Africa, which is Giz, which is one of the oldest written languages in the world. And so in, in all these explorations, I was also returning back to public art um, and then using collage making a lot and also fusing these worlds of digital painting, painting um, and digital art and then public art making. So these worlds started to come together during this time period. And so this was a mural that I did um, for Ch Chatewale. Um, for Chatewale and Chalewoti, uh, a, a street festival in Ghana. And so this was put on the side of a building. And again, I, I want to pay homage to monuments. So one of the big monuments in Ghana, in Accra, is uh, this structure, the independent structure. And then I wanted to show these aunties from different places, from different places that I travel to, show these aunties kind of dancing together because for me, the Afro future is a, is a safe space where elderly women can feel free to dance in the public. You know, I think about my grandmother uh, who's a Pentecostal Christian and they have a thing called getting into the spirit where they, you know, they do all these dances and I seen her do it one time and I was like, it's like, how do you move like that? I'm like, God damn it, grandma. And so, Seeing some of these, uh, some of these aunties, some of these grandmothers uh, dance at some of these uh, events, it made me think about how can I create a space where where uh, these aunties can feel safe to dance, and that to me is the Afro future. And so again, I wanted to represent young people. Um, these are 3D scans that I re-sculpted, and then wanted to show these young people in the future, and then these were shown in schools as well. And so this leads to the last part of my, my work, which is the current stuff that I started to create. And this is about going from projection to reflection, communal reflection. Because I started to realize that uh, the work is not only just for black people, it's not only just for continental or diasporic people, it's for all people. And so I wanted us to recognize what one community and start to reflect on that. And so 2017 was an important moment because I lost my best friend. Uh, Rory was one of my hugest, biggest supporters. He'd been, through me, uh, he'd been with me through thick and thin. Uh, he was a person who encouraged me to go back to school. He actually took a break from his graduation class and actually like waited for me to come back into school to graduate with me. So he had like one course to do. And like the fact that he put off school for like five years just so he can graduate with me, with me meant a lot. So this was us on our graduation. And Rory passed away. Uh, from a brain aneurysm in 2017 out of nowhere but before the day he passed away he told me to keep growing and if you ever see my social media it says keep growing q and that's his last message to me but one of the things that really stuck to me was his message you can't create change unless you can first imagine it and i realized that that's what my work was doing i was all about expanding the black imagination expanding how we saw blackness expanding how we, we, we thought about race, expanding how we thought about community. And that was because a lot of times we can't imagine it. And so I felt like my duty as an artist was to help people imagine the possibilities to then we can work towards it collectively. And so that led me into doing more public art. And so this public art piece that I made during the pandemic was about that. How can we share these stories? 
and 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 kind of work together towards thinking about the the future that we want to see. And so this was an uh, art piece called Olamina, inspired by uh, Octavia Butler, uh, and this idea of change and embracing change. Right, we were in a moment of change was happening, and uh, I consulted with a couple uh, indigenous elders and Anishinaabe elders and made this piece, paying homage to Mami Wata from Africa, but also paying homage to uh, the different African story, I mean, sorry, the different indigenous stories here in Canada around water carrying memory and water being spiritual. And so I first created this piece digitally as a 3D model. Then it was, it was, it was uh, then CNC cut, and then I added some hand, hand carving. And so this was my first time exploring the use of new media to create a public art piece. And so as you can see, exactly how it looks digitally is exactly how it came out in real life. But this was like my most ambitious piece at this time. And so a part of this uh, art piece was it had a head wrap. And uh, it, it was related to a song about how African women wrap the whole world in their head wrap. Uh, in Nigeria, they have something called a gili. And it's like a huge, it looks like, it actually looks like, uh, an, uh, an elder pointed out and it's like, it's actually the shape of the Milky Way. And I was like, ah, she has a galaxy on her head. And so, uh, so the idea was in the head wrap, people could put messages, things that they want to grow. And then we also had a plant exchange. And so again, we had people from all walks of life uh, participating. And so that art piece led me to doing the first monument, my first uh, permanent art piece, which is of Joshua Glover. And the thing I want to speak about with Joshua Glover was it was, it was uh, a piece where I explored, again, the use of this new media going from 3D sculpting to 3D printing to bronze casting. But also, it was the opportunity to really bring in all my research together. I was really uh, hell-bent on not telling a slave story. I was like, ah, I'm not going to do it. It doesn't sit right with my ancestors. And when the opportunity came, I actually was... I actually refused. I was like, I'm not doing this piece. What do you mean? You want me to make Toronto's first monument of a person of African descent to be of an enslaved person? And it just didn't sit right with me. And um, I went to sleep. My wife told me, no, you should do it. You should do it. And I learned the hard way. You should always listen to your wife. But um, she kept telling me, you should do it. You should do it. And then she told me to meditate on it. And, and when I meditate on it, I asked my ancestors what I should do. Because to her, she already knew what I should do. She's like, the money's right. The opportunity's right. You've been talking about doing this for, all, for how many years? Here's your opportunity. Why would you walk away from it? And I kid you not, I, I meditated. I fell asleep. Had a dream of exactly this, of Joshua Glover, or what I thought to be a representation of Joshua Glover, stepping through a portal, and he had these books, and he's kind of leaving behind, passing away his chains. And, um, and, and, he, and he just walked, he looked over my head and was looking out into the future and into the, into the, into the distance. And, uh, and that's, that's exactly what I decided to create. Well, not what I decided to create. That's exactly what I had to create. Also, a funny thing is um, I made the piece digitally uh, at 4.44 a.m. within 22 minutes. I went back to sleep. Woke up and I was like, ah, I don't think this is good. And I made four other versions, submitted all of them together, and it's the first version that they went with. So the one that took me the least amount of time is the one that ends up um, becoming the permanent art piece and a part of history. And so this is different um, stages of me working on the piece in the foundry and showing that process. And so one of the things that was really important was adding symbolism. Again, the Sankofanology. And so I had that represented in the flowers. So the first flower represents him coming from the state of Missouri, where he was first enslaved. Uh, then the, the blue violet represents uh, where he was detained and where he, where he found, where he broke out and got freedom to come to Ontario. And then the white trillium represents him living in Ontario. So again, this idea of the past, present, and future. But also I want to show him as a time traveler. So the arm, the cyborg arm represents when he was not treated as a human, when he was treated as a, as a, as a machine, as a robot, as, a, as an object, 
and his inhumane experiences as an enslaved African. And then he's regaining his humanity. And the story that I was rece- that was given to me as a download was it all started with his imagination. He had to imagine that he could be free before he got free. He had to imagine that freedom was possible and he could see himself without chains or without being whipped before he can actually make it a reality. And so I put the Pan-African symbol of the hibiscus flower, which is uh, present throughout the, uh, throughout the continent, throughout the diaspora, to represent how he healed, how he saw himself. And so I put all these different things into this art piece, and actually on the sculpture itself, you have the Sankofa symbol. So again, you know, living up to the mission I was given. So again, does anybody know what that, which, which symbol is that? Yeah, the Sankofa Dua. And so, um, very fortunate to actually have Jean, the Honorable Jean Augustine, and actually the following year I made the bus of her, which I actually forgot to include in this, in this, uh, in this presentation. But the hope is, next time you see me, I will actually have the bronze sculpture of Jean Augustine. But these stories that I tell of the future that reclaims African history, African and historical past, holds me accountable to be the best version of myself I can be to use my gifts for others. And so for me, it was really important to continue to share these gifts, which is why I started to explore augmented reality, because I wanted people to be able to take some of these ideas home and think with them. And um, if you go to my website, you can actually visit some of these augmented reality pieces and, um, and explore, explore them in your own way. Um, this one was to speak to this idea of indigenous and African solidarity with the elephant representing Africa and the turtle obviously representing Turtle Island. On one side you have the Sankofa symbol, on the other side you have the medicine wheel. So again, speaking to this idea of healing through the past, being informed to the present for the future, ancestral technofossils. Again, uh, looking on each side, you have past, present, future, and then it was site-specific site in Montreal. So according to different locations that you went in Montreal, um, you'll get these different historical references, and this is actually is going to be back on display um, coming next month in March at the Five Foundation. And so I want to wrap up with this last art piece. But uh, Sankofanology and Afrofuturism in my work is a movement of stories and conversation with African legacies and a dance of speculation of what could be. And for me, this is really important because it's really uh, foundational for people to think about where are we going, how are we get in there, and who do we want to be there? And my answer is everyone. And so when I made this art piece that was commissioned by Carnegie Hall, it was really important to add as much historical references and different uh, reference points for people people thriving and surviving in the future context and being the masters of technology rather than being the tools. It is the high culture of the African diaspora and how people of African descent operate with agency. What if in fact we thought of the experience of African Americans as not just rigidly historical and connected to slave ships and pyramids, etc. What if we also added the metaphor of space travel? the metaphors of technology and robotics. Not only would that revise how we remember race, but also it would give us a vision of the future in which black people played a central and significant part. So when when Carnegie Carnegie Hall contacted me and asked me to make this piece, I was like, all right, cool, no problem. Maybe can I see some other art pieces by a black artist that you commissioned so I can kind of get a sense of like, you know, how they approached it. They're like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, of course. They came back to me, they're like, oh, well, we can't share nothing with you because uh, we have never commissioned any artist before. I was like, what do you, what do you, and I had no clue, like, the, the gravity of what that meant. Like, I knew Carnegie Hall was a big deal, but I didn't know, like, how big of a deal it was, you know? And luckily, I already had knew exactly what I wanted to make. I already knew, uh, what I was going to do before they even asked me to do it um, because I had the dream and I consulted with the ancestors and they're like, ah, this is the future. Hurry up and do it. 
so you can get it done in time and then, you know, um, and, and allow people to, to, to connect to it. So I want you to take a moment to do this pose. If you can, if you can lift your arms. I want you to mimic this pose. And I'm curious to know, you can put your hands down now. When you do that, what comes to mind? Holding up, beautiful. What else? What did you feel when you did it? Mm. Mm. Graceful. Graceful. Yeah, so that you know, was like not what I was thinking. I was like, okay, this pose is cool, but then I realized that it was a reference to the June Tyson pose. And June Tyson was a dancer, and she did that pose as a sun dance. And so in this art piece, I made, uh, well, they counted 17 references, but there was a total of 28 references in relation to 28 chromosomes. And so I wanted it to, to be very rich with information and different references to history and African history and culture. And so the idea is that, you know, it can be something that can be studied uh, for many years to come. And I didn't intentionally did it, but I kind of intentionally did it. But again, it was just being ancestrally aligned. And so this is now on Google Arts and Culture. It was, it was featured uh, last year uh, throughout the month of February on Google Arts and Culture. And that was the first time that they actually uh, featured something like that on Google Arts and Culture. So they had all the references broken down. And if you go on it, you can actually learn about some of these references all the way from June Tyson and Sun Ra to the Nuck uh, of Benin to uh, more currently to Esperanza Spalding to the Black Panther references in this art piece. And so these stories that tell of the future that reclaims African uh, historically past holds me accountable for me to be the best version of myself I can be to use my gift for others. And I wanted to emphasize on this aspect. But my ancestors fought so I could be free to do so. So the stories I tell are reminders of gratitude and a challenge to dare to be great. Currently, I'm working on this, uh, this archway uh, called Rayan um, in Mississauga. And it's the first, as mentioned in my bio, it's the first uh, collaboration between a black and brown artist in Mississauga. And I want to just leave you with this. Bloom is a dynamic gateway inspired by the indigenous meaning of Mississauga, river with many mouths. Reflecting that definition, Rayan, which means cosmic flower, explores a symbolic connection we can share and exchange with the cosmos through the language of sacred geometry. The artists, Quentin Persetti and Javid Ja, combine their different cultural backgrounds to create more visibility for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. They aspire to create permanent landmarks that celebrate ancestral stories within the urban fabric of Canada. Located at the west entrance of the park, it has a twisting structure that integrates the symbolic meaning of the cosmic elements, ether, fire, earth, air, and water, which are featured in the following ways. A flowering archway frames the park through an Islamic architectural strategy known as Mukarnas. The crystal forms an oculus that highlights particular constellations each night. Perforated panels with adinkra symbols and glowing jewels amplify our connection to the elements. With the colors, we are open to consulting with the community to determine the final palette, but we are kind of feeling these colors, to be honest. Rayan, a cosmic bloom, is about the way we blossom when we consider our connection to the cosmos. It will inspire a sense of pride and wonder in Mississauga for years to come. So I want to thank you for uh, joining us, and I hope we can come to the opening uh, in October when we uh, unveil Rayan, the cosmos of bloom, where you can also contemplate your connection to the cosmos. I want to thank you.